Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I am H. Robert Silverstein, MD, for West Hartford Cable Access TV and the Preventive Medicine Center, both of which are 501c3s, so the proverbial, as I often quote from my son, send millions fast. That's how he used to sign all of his uh, letters to me when he was in college, SMF, send millions fast. So you will get a tax deduction if you contribute to either. Now, uh, this is the uh, first um, show of the fall season of 2020. And uh, we generally take the summer off, and actually it's uh, between the Jewish holidays now, between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, uh, Lashana Tova. Uh, and I hope that everybody is having a happy new year. Uh, let's get to uh, several of the items that I wrote. Um, the first one is about the difficulties of where we are uh, emotionally, politically, as a nation, and so on. And this has to do with talking about burnout. Uh, this was something I wrote on a professional blog. Uh, they got uh, very few responses. You can respond to what I've written. Uh, this was a comment. This may not be overly popular, but it is offered as the least convoluted approach to stress and burnout. Bad things happen and should not be unexpected. The basic problem in burnout is unrealistic expectations that things should be different from what they are. Now, I go on from there, but uh, I must say in all honesty, what surprises me about the anger in the United States, uh, even in the world, is that there are so many unrealistic expectations. Things are what they are. And at the same time, there is not collegial, friendly, open discussion. Things come out with anger. I have a very close associate. I would call him a friend. I'm not sure he'd call me a friend. Uh, the person who taught me much about uh, the dietary direction that I recommend uh, in 1983 is when our relationship started. But his son wrote on a blog on Facebook that uh, I don't remember what it was, but it was political, and I didn't like the tone of it. So I said, your first, second, and fourth sentences were not very friendly and uh, didn't invite discussion. Well, my former teacher, friend, colleague now, uh, he's actually younger than I am, uh, but he did teach me, like I said, about grains, vegetables, beans, fruit, nuts, and seeds, miso soup, and seaweed. Um, sauerkraut, live sauerkraut, uh, uh, controlling salt, and so on, uh, unprocessed organic whole foods, which is correct for the human biology, and I offer much respect to him for what he has meant and been in my life. Uh, but uh, he got on me for being pompous when all I was trying to say is, hey, let's just have a collegial, there was so much anger. Of course, it was his son that I was responding to, uh, he took it as attacking, and I've seen that pattern in his son and in him before. Once he got upset with me because I, he accused me of using uh, my teacher friend colleague, got upset with me, for, uh, and his response was something about nation. And I think the implication was that there is a world, but there are not nations. That's nonsense. Uh, there are lines, borders, uh, different cultures, different tribes, and they have the right to define themselves. Uh, Hindus have the right to define themselves. Muslims have the right to define themselves. Uh, not that they shouldn't be part of America, but they have the right to define themselves in their own categories, just as nations have the right to define themselves. Uh, you may say, oh, I'm implying uh, about the southern border. I'm implying about the southern border, the northern border, uh, coming into the United States by airplane from wherever, uh, staying here uh, legally or illegally. There are laws that protect us. Without that law, there would be anarchy. If you want to change the law, then go through the legal process and change the law. But all of this has to do with unrealistic expectations, which is the cause of much anxiety and much depression. People think things should be different from, from what they are, and they no longer have... Uh, I use this phrase, which will certainly seem out of date, pioneering spirit. What do you think somebody who lived entirely in the woods during the 1600s, 1700s, even 1800s, as our 
uh, borders moved west towards California. Uh, remember the go west young man? Uh, what, how do you, what do you think they did when somebody broke a leg or a child died or the crops didn't come in? You, you cannot sit there and, so to speak, cry in your beer. That's not productive or helpful. It's counterproductive and destructive. And so what all of this pioneering behavior has to be brought back, in my best guess, to the concept of individual responsibility. And people, uh, that's incomprehensible to a large share of people that there is individual responsibility. Well, there certainly is if you drive too fast or you drink too much and you get caught uh, for drunken behavior or if you slap someone in public, there are laws. And it isn't like we get to believe in some laws and not other laws. There are the laws and we need to realistically accept them. Now, I hope this begins a debate. A lot of people will say, well, you didn't do this and you did that and so on. Fine. I want to hear it. I want a collegial, open discussion about where I was right and where I was wrong. And um, uh, there is a Preventive Medicine Center a website uh, that says, inf and an email that says info at PMC. And then you can write uh, to me that way. Uh, obviously, you can write letters to my office, and you can write letters even to West Hartford Cable TV, and I will come pick them up. So anyhow, I hope we're discussing, uh, starting an open discussion about whatever it is you want to talk about. And I've made the point now several times that I want it to be collegial. I don't want any attacks. You start attacking me, I'm tearing the letter up. Don't waste your time. That's not collegial discussion. If you wish to say, well, you didn't think of this and you didn't think of that and you thought you overinterpreted, fine, 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 fine. Enough of that. Uh, I could go on. It's, it's not really that long. It's only this long. But I think reading that on TV would get a little bit boring. Next, um, this is something that uh, I have not posted on the website. It's called successful change. Self-monitoring, routinely keeping track, as in a food journal, is the most predictive for successful change dietarily. Now, frankly, it doesn't have anything to do with diet. Well, it does have to do with diet, but it has to do with anything you want to change. There is a wonderful, wonderful little book. It comes in two versions. It's called Food Journal. Um, and Food Journal, uh, we have them at the office, and you can order them online. They're not very expensive. They're seven, eight, nine, ten dollars and uh, you open it up and you have down here three meals on this day and then you're supposed to put down your thinking. Forget the thinking, that's the next day. And so you just write down what you had for breakfast and if you have a snack after breakfast, you move it up to breakfast. Then there's a space for lunch and then there's a space, a skip a space. And if, if you have a snack, you put it up there at lunch and then there's dinner. By the way, I read uh, an article this morning about um, diabetes and it turns out that people who stick to three meals a day and no snacking have bigger improvements in their uh, weight, diet, and so on um, than if they have the six small meals a day. That sort of surprised me, but hey, facts are facts. Uh, another thing is uh, that I read about fructose. Fructose as, a, as, a, as opposed to glucose. Fructose and sucrose which is made half of fructose, affect the liver in a completely different fashion than does glucose. Fructose, fructose and sucrose, affect the liver adversely in a completely different fashion from simple glucose. I'm not saying glucose as sugar is good for you, but I am definitely saying Fructose and high fructose corn syrup is definitely worse for the liver. Going back, self-monitoring. If you write it down, it's kind of a feedback. I'm not talking about an app on your phone. I mean to hand write it with pen or pencil into this neat little book that fits into almost any pocket or purse, and you should always have it with you, and then you simply write down what you eat. That 
brings you to an awareness more so than anything else. My patients who do this lose weight. The patients who forget to bring their book uh, or stop writing don't lose weight. So it is a marker of success. Shift your focus. Be calm. Be patient. Pay attention. What is your goal? All right. Next uh, is uh, timing is everything. Now, these are just uh, papers that I printed to bring in for the show. Timing is everything. It turns out, as everyone knows, if you eat for go before going to bed, within a few hours of going to bed, that you're less likely to lose weight. You're more likely to maintain your weight. If you can stop eating, and now here's what I tell patients. Let's say you get up at uh, 6.30. I have some patients who get up at 3 o'clock, and that's, but whenever you get up, I say move it to the next hour. So if you get up at 3 in the morning, I start counting at 4. If you get up at 6.30, I skip the half hour, go to 7, and then don't start counting till 8. So you, you are allowed nine hours of eating, and after that, you may only have tea with uh, lemon or lime, or steamed vegetables excluding potatoes of any kind. That includes sweet potatoes, no sweet potatoes. So you can have broccoli, cauliflower, carrots, onions, snow peas, mushrooms, green beans, kale, collard greens, carrot and bee tops, mustard and turnip greens, leeks, scallions, summer squash, winter squash, burdock, daikon, cucumber, celery, radishes, and so on. I forgot daikon. Did I put daikon in there? Anyhow, um, you, I've I call it 26. I don't know whether it's 24 or 30, but I call it 26 vegetables you can have. And you can have those after the nine hours starting from counting. So let's say you get up at 6.30, and then we start counting at 8. 8 to 12 is 4. 12 to 5 is 5 more. 4 and 5 are 9. So if you get up at, what did I say, 6.30, 7, 8? Yeah, if you get up at 6.30, then uh, you can stop eating by 5 o'clock. Now you may say, well, what about dinner with the family and so on? You can have your steamed vegetables. But you're going to get the main portion of any calorie intake, which ought to be ideally organic, unprocessed whole foods, 19 of 21 meals a week with wild-caught fish or free-range chicken or cage-free eggs or bison up to twice a week, 19 of 21 meals a week organic, unprocessed, uh, plant-based diet, and two meals a week can contain, if you're trim. If you're not trim, once every 10 days for a piece of animal protein. So um, this is how to prevent multiple diseases simultaneously, the motto of our Preventive Medicine Center. All right, changing completely. We may come back to that. 10 years after climate gate, global warming, if you look, this was an article by David Archibald, and what it shows is that there is no correlation between carbon dioxide content in the atmosphere and the rise in temperature. Uh, if, there were, if there were a relationship between carbon dioxide and, uh, in the atmosphere and temperature, the temperature would have gone up remarkably much more than there is which shows there is no correlation with carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. The article is by David Archibald. It's called 10 Years After Climate Gate, Global Warming. And it was a fantastic article that, uh, you see, I, I believe there's definitely climate change. Uh, I'm perfectly aware that there is a 14 day longer growing season. The earth is greening. Does that mean that the ice caps are melting? Uh, that I'm not so sure of. Uh, you know, there was an explanation for why the Antarctic ice cap was uh, melting. There was a volcano. Volcanoes are heat underneath. In large part, that explained it. Same thing happened in either Greenland or Iceland, I think in Greenland, that there was a volcano that was erupting, which was melting the ice in Greenland. I'm not saying global warming didn't have an effect, but you see, I don't want people jumping to conclusions that global warming was the cause of both of those meltings when there are other explanations that need to be figured in and routinely have not. Uh, just this morning, I read an article that said um, 
when the uh, UN IPCC meeting was taking place, there was a retraction of an article that had been published in Nature about warming of the ocean, and their methodology was completely wrong and had to be retracted completely. And again, there is a hysteria uh, that Greta Thunberg, um, she may be a child, but she doesn't get off for her misbehavior. Somebody needs to straighten her out. Uh, she was so angry. That is not how to be. That is not collegial behavior. Yes, I got the message, and I got the message that there is something wrong with the way she presented her information. People don't get up and start shouting in the midst of the United Nations. I know Nikita Khrushchev did that, but, uh, and he pounded on the table. He took off his shoe, pounded on the table. Uh, that was one of the great events that I remember. It was very scary because he had uh, hydrogen bombs and atom bombs and rockets uh, that could have exterminated the, the United States and Western civilization as a whole. But uh, uh, anyhow, Greta Thunberg's uh, act, behavior, uh, she was called a young rattle. Uh, that struck me as uh, an appropriate terminology. They say she has some mental disorder, OCD or uh, autism or whatever. Regardless, her behavior is absolutely unacceptable, and we as a culture need to start to civilize, have civil discussions completely. I hope I'm not haranguing you today. If I am, let me know. Uh, there needs to be more civil discourse with a civil tone. Uh, I saw Alan Dershowitz uh, uh, talking not so long ago, I don't remember where it was, but he said he's being shunned because he's appeared on Fox Network. This is one of the great legal minds of our times. I think Alan Dershowitz is the major legal mind that is available publicly. Uh, the man is, uh, it, by the way, I was surprised to read, uh, read that he defended that Klaus whatever who murdered his wife. Uh, I didn't know that. Uh, kind of, uh, he seemed on the wrong side of that discussion, although attorneys don't get to judge their, pay, uh, their clients, they take them as they find them. That is the rule of an attorney. We take our clients as we find them. Uh, in a certain sense, as a physician, that's what I do. Uh, that doesn't mean that uh, attorneys have to like their patients. Uh, that means that they have a job to do, and that is their job. So anyhow, 10 Years After Climate Gate, Gate, Global Warming, by David Archibald, and this was dated March 21st, 2019. I consider it a very valuable read. Next, we're back to successful change. Now, the wellness protecting numbers. Diseases are made to happen unless very late in the game they can be made to unhappen. 95% of diabetes, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, high triglycerides, the need for open heart surgery, angioplasty, stent, are preventable. So we could eliminate that entire major killer atherosclerosis, which also includes stroke, by paying attention to the Preventive Medicine Center's wellness protecting numbers. You can go to our website and see them. I didn't say they were easy. I didn't say they were fun. Uh, they can be made acceptable. They can be made just fine. Let's, it starts off with one, non-HDL cholesterol. That's where you subtract the good cholesterol from the total, and that number needs to be 90. The concept is risk regression to zero. There is a number where the cholesterol is low enough, the non-HDL cholesterol is low enough, that hardening of the arteries cannot and will not occur. That number is 90. Now is that 100% true? It is true enough, and I don't mean by 60 to 40, I mean like 99 to 1. Yes, there are some heart attacks that do occur with a non-HDL cholesterol of 90, but very, 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 very few. It is essentially risk regression to zero. One of the things that I talk about is uh, the following line from the Merchant of Venice. The quality of mercy is not strained, it droppeth as the dew from the heavens. 
Now, I have a close friend who criticizes me because that's not the exact wording, but that's the exact wording as I remember it and I believe as I read it. Regardless, it's a beautiful sentence from Shakespeare. Uh, the quality of mercy is not strained, it droppeth as the dew from the heaven. There is a gentility in that concept. There is a gentility in the number non-HDL cholesterol of 90 or less. It's not a bludgeon. It is a simple, gentle fact that is essentially true by, like I said, 99 to 1. Then the next one is blood pressure of 110 to 115 over 60 to 70. That's where heart attack and risk stops with regard to blood pressure. The first number, the non-HDL cholesterol, is where heart attack stops uh, with regard to cholesterol. Then there's the A1C diabetes test. Your A1C should be your age with a decimal point in it up to the age of 62. So if you are 55, it should be 5.5. And if you are 65, it should be 6.2. So that's sort of the range. <clears throat> I don't believe that it can, if you're in your 20s and 30s, I don't think your A1C can be 2 or 3. But I definitely think 4.4 is a reasonable place to start. So beginning at age 44 and below, and up to the age of 62, it should be your age with a decimal point in it for a diabetes test. If it's above that, your risk of heart attack and other diabetic complications are going to occur. I had an idea recently that is really bizarre. And I don't know about bizarre. It may be very insightful, but I'm a little bit cautious about it. I think if you take magnesium and you get your magnesium up to 2.2 or 2.3, it sort of prevents the development of diabetes. Now be careful in taking magnesium. You can take too much. You can get diarrhea from magnesium. You can get, uh, uh, frankly, uh, uh, many abnormalities from taking too much magnesium. It's that old Goldilocks zone concept. Not too much, not too little, but just right. But that is a suspicion of mine. And I recommend a magnesium of 2.1 plus, meaning up to about 2.4, uh, for people to have. And all my vegan vegetarians have a magnesium of 2.1 to 2.4. Most of them around 2.3 to 2.4. And then uh, there's uh, the triglycerides need to be 100 or less. And you may say, oh, that's so low. Look, don't argue with me. I'm telling you what I think, think is science. That is your risk regresses to zero when your triglycerides are 100 or less. Going on, cardiac C-reactive protein, everybody's sort of tuned into that. Yes, it is a marker of inflammation within the body. And you may say, well, why is the body inflamed? Uh, five minutes. The body is inflamed because of what we do. There is even a concept now called the inflammasome. That's like the genome. There's a whole bunch of factors with interleukins and interferons and uh, tumor necrosis factor that uh, represent anger within the body. And when those things climb up, because we made them climb up, remember, diseases are made to happen. If you take a look at the numbers in pre-technological civilization, pre-technological means they don't have bicycles yet, they don't have electricity yet, uh, they are living essentially outdoors. Uh, if you take a look at their numbers, they are what I say here, and they have none of our diseases. There's a group of uh, Bolivian uh, uh, Amazonian Indians called the Chimani, T-S-I-M-A-N-E. And there are also the Yanamamo. I believe the latter are cannibals, but forgive me if that's not a true statement. It's sort of what I recall and it is subject to correction. But anyhow, those Indians have, uh, those people who live in the Amazon jungle have none of our diseases. They have no high blood pressure, no high cholesterol, no high triglycerides, no cancer of the colon, no need for open heart surgery, angioplasty, stent, and they've even been studied with CAT scans, CAT scans by coronary calcium scores, which are not 100% reliable, but generally, generally at the 99 plus percent level, are reliable. It's a very common test. 
uh, that uh, is becoming more popular to determine whether you have risk of a heart attack or not. If your score comes back below 100, you're essentially at very low risk. If your score comes back at zero, you're essentially at no risk of hardening of the arteries. But if your score comes back 1,000 or 2,000, as I've had patients, and there are even higher scores, then you need to do further investigation to see whether or not an angioplasty, a stent, or open heart surgery is necessary. And I've had all of those circumstances where people did go on to a procedure or were uh, relieved to know they did not need a procedure. All right, continuing on. Sodium content. When you buy any container, look at the sodium content in percent. Pretend, percent is easier to remember than milligrams. The serving that you're going to eat should have 12% sodium or less. Now that's each different container. What if you have three different containers at 12% in the serving you're going to eat? And by the way, most cans have anywhere from two to four servings in them. So you have to do the calculation on what you are going to eat today, now. So 12% or less. And you may say, well, what if one container has 12%, another container has 12%, another container has 12%? For whatever reason, in all life, practically, it works out okay because you don't end up having so many different containers with 12% sodium in them. Cancer of the prostate, that score should be uh, PSA, uh, should be 1.0. If you do the high sensitivity, it needs to be four or less. Uh, blood pressure we talked about. Your blood count, your red blood count, shouldn't be too much or shouldn't be too little should be a hemoglobin right around 14. Uh, your uric acid should be around 5.5 or less. Your kidney test, BUN, should be 12 or less. Your potassium should be 4.1 to 4.5. Your vitamin D level should be 50 to 66, not 30. 50 to 66, I believe, is the right number. These are my best guesses, and they're best guesses. And, and I tell patients, and I don't mean this uh, to sound silly, if you think I'm right, then do what I say. And if you think I'm wrong, you ought to get a physician who you have confidence in. Uh, well, I'm getting the high sign, uh, one minute. All right, well, I hope I entertained you. I hope you enjoyed the above, uh, the previous, and that it was educational and entertaining. Um, and uh, that's all we're gonna talk about today. So I wanna say on behalf of West Hartford Cable Access TV and the Preventive Medicine Center. I am H. Robert Silverstein, MD, and SMF. Have a great weekend and Happy New Year to all, and uh, we'll see you next time.